When it comes to healing, we can do all the right things, yet fail nonetheless. There is a simple reason why, and what I'm about to share with you in this video does contain some graphic content, so viewer discretion is advised. But there is no other way to tell it, otherwise the rest of the video will not make any sense. In this picture, you see a scar, and I'll explain how this appeared on my arm. Throughout my entire childhood, I don't remember a day where my head didn't hurt. I was often absorbed in thought and I felt head heavy and I wasn't able to sit still. And in order to sleep at night, I would often take Panadol to ease the pain. When I turned 19, my dad took me to his lifelong mentor, who was 92 at the time. His mentor didn't say much to me, instead he used his wooden walking stick to walk into his room and then he came back out with two books and he asked me to pick one. I may never know what the other book was because I didn't read the title, I simply picked the book based on the cover. But the book that I did pick was The Path Now by Eckhart Tolle. And I read this book cover to cover three times in a space of a week and my headaches completely vanished and I was able to finally sit still. And uh, this impact was so profound that from that moment on, I would not allow my mind to deviate from this moment. It would be four years later at 11 a.m. October 11th, 2008, that I would put another theory to the test. By this time, I'd already started studying neuroscience, fascinated by the human mind, and I had come across the idea that the human brain processes emotional pain in the same brain regions as physical pain, and this being the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, to be specific. And being young and foolish at that time, I decided to put this to the test the hard way. I underwent a process known as scarification, which is like something straight out of Wakanda, where a piece of art that I designed myself was carved into my skin with a knife. Now I want to make clear that I'm in no way advocating self-harm. For me, this was a test of sheer willpower to face my fears and see how far I could stretch my mind before breakpoint. In order to do this, I prepared myself to cross the pain barrier. But I had a more immediate challenge that I would have to face because I used to faint at the sight of blood and I had trained my mind to not be interrupted by thought when I was doing brain surgery on sharks for my master's degree. So at this point I had learned not to be afraid of my own thoughts. So now I could neutralize emotional pain as well as remain hyper-focused for an extended period of time. So I was ready. The procedure took two hours and I was bleeding the entire time. And I did not use any painkillers or anesthetics. In fact, I had detached from the pain as if it weren't my own. And I've never had an outer body experience, but you can think of it uh, similar to that. I would later learn that the separation between brain and body is how people cope with trauma. They check out from their own body and become numb to feeling. And this is a complete separation between brain and body. The only difference is that I did this voluntarily. Having voluntary control over my own mind and being at peace did not make me happy. In fact, I'd become a monk in a modern world, and the nature of my experiences meant that it was unrelatable, unbelievable, and unattainable. But I did not do any of this to be understood. In fact, I was testing out what sounded great in theory, but did these neuroscience principles hold up in practice? I was studying neuroscience to find a softer entry point, something that was easier, something that was simpler, because the goal wasn't to have a million practices, but the one practice that just worked, and it would be the shortest part to stillness. I was looking for something specific, something measurable, something tangible, and neuroscience had become this obsession against the unrelatable, unbelievable, and unattainable. Maybe there was something I could discover, a clue or a hidden doorway into the mind, Yet the key to opening this door was hidden where I did not care to look. 
The mind is a useful servant, but a dangerous master. So far I had looked at mind over matter, but this is only half the story. As my interest in neuroscience descended from the unconscious into the subconscious, I began to realize that we had been led to believe that the brain has authority over the body. This self-dominance, this mind of a matter, is the source of separation between the brain and body. More importantly, the strength of communication between brain and body can be measured and is known as vagal tone. Finally, something specific, something that can be measured and uh, what can be measured can be improved on. So this marked the beginning of my life's work, the connection between brain and body. There was, however, a price to pay. I'd spent nearly two decades in the field of neuroscience, yet the significance of classical neuroscience had began to erode right in front of my eyes. Without harmony between brain and body, we could do all the right things, yet fail nonetheless. And luckily, besides neuroscience, I had also fallen in love with human movement. I did capoeira for eight years, and became an instructor. I did yoga for three years straight uh, without missing a single day. And by the time I'd started my PhD, I was training three hours a day, six days a week under the Edo Portal method. And towards the end of my PhD, I was teaching some of these movement techniques to improve vagal tone. And I taught these workshops attended by hundreds of people and this is how I tested what worked and what didn't. And one thing became very clear. In order to reset the body into its natural state, we had to teach the body itself. And the body does not learn verbally, it learns in the language of movement. Using movement, I trained the vagal breathing technique to kick in by itself before the fight or flight mode is triggered. And this is how we use movement to reset the body to a parasympathetic baseline. This is the complete inverse of techniques out there showing you a way out when you're already in the fight or flight state. So these movements train the nervous system to act instinctually rather than when you're already in your head trying to figure a way out by instructing the body what to do. So it's no longer about being at war with your own mind but rather the ultimate act of self-dominance, which is for the mind to let it all go. And this is how you heal the connection between brain and body. And working instinctually with the body led to the genesis of the trainee nervous system program, which I'll link in the description below. Your body has been with you through everything that you've ever experienced, and it will remain with you till the very end. When the mind steps out of the way and allows the heart to lead, we experience this sensation of inhabiting our own body for the first time. It is then that we realize that this separation between brain and body is an illusion. I designed this scar on my arm with two spirals, one going inward and the other going outward based on this Fibonacci sequence. And the meaning behind it is that once the inward journey is complete, it is time for the outward journey to begin, because the greatest journey that you'll ever take is the one that begins with your own heart. The synergy between brain and body is how we live wholeheartedly, and this creates a domino effect where everything else in our lives starts to fall in place. So if you want to learn more about the brain and the body connection, you can watch this video linked here.